Neil's competency building goes. And Richardson is is put up a show in MENA region with the help of Imaticus. And uh, those who don't know about Imaticus, Imaticus is the leading ad tech company. We, our vision and our goal is to bridge the gap between academia and the corporates. And we are there. We are into technology. We are into banking. We're into finance. And for sales competency building, we have tied up with Richardson in the MENA region. Next slide, please, Savan. And these are some of the most reputed brand names we work globally, uh, both from finance, technology, global centers. We served close to 120 clients in the corporate space, and 85% of our business is repeat customers. So I'll now hand it over to Tim and Michael to, to give us a deep insights about consultative selling and what the modern day buyers are looking for, how the world of sales has changed uh, in the digital world. So over to you, Michael and Tim. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, my name is Tim Sullivan. I am the Vice President of Business Development at Richardson, and we're very pleased to be here. Uh, and we thank Amarticus for their kind invitation uh, to come to you today and share some, uh, what I hope will, will be some useful information um, very, very pleased to have my colleague Michael Strauss on the uh, session today. Michael is one of our most experienced consultants, having worked with literally hundreds of organizations in just about every industry all over the world. In fact, Michael, uh, you've been recently promoted. Uh, what is your new title now? I'm uh, Vice President of Customer Solutions, leading our design and customization department. Excellent. Congratulations, by the way, and well-deserved. Um, when I was approached by Amarticus about the topic of helping salespeople to improve how they prepare and execute sales conversations and engagement with customers, uh, Michael is the first person that I thought of uh, because he's had the most experience with uh, our consultative selling skills content. And so, uh, with uh, He's going to be doing most of the talking today, but we encourage your questions. If you could type them in the q and uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer them as we go along today. So, Michael, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so, you know, we, as we kind of talk about what it means to sell to modern buyers, I think at first it's best to kind of describe what we mean when we say modern buyers. You know, that is a phrase that quite frankly, we've used throughout time and we always describe what the current buyer is. But, you know, you think about how fast the environment changes now. And, you know, five years ago, we were talking about modern buyers as being the ones who are, you know, they have access to technology, They're, they have a lot more information and it's all at their fingertips. But then think, just think how much the world has changed in the last five years. You know, modern buyers now, yeah, they still have all the information, but now they've got the weight of all the different changes that are taking place in the world. And, you know, as the, those changes continue to rapidly pile on, we go from a, you know, a, a, a full functioning, well-rounded uh, world economy. And then, you know, 12 months later, we're starting to kind of go into a bit more of a, of a um, more conservative, you know, uh, uh, economy where people might be a bit more guarded with their, their time, their money. And that's really what we talk about when we talk about that modern buyer. So, you know, by the time they come to you in this uh, conversation or, or seek out, you know, help for, for any sale, really, they're far along in that journey. And they've been researching. They know what's available. They've probably already compared you to competitors. So the job of the seller then is not to, you know, be able to introduce themselves and reintroduce your content because the, the, honestly, the, the customer probably already knows that. And that's really where the job of the seller is to establish that, that uh, feeling of trust and trust is, as you can see on this slide here, you know, as buyer behaviors change and, you know, we talk about all that information that's available to them and all the research available, but trust still is the number one thing that ends up overriding all the other uh, factors when it comes to making those decisions. And if you're, uh, you know, and I'm sure many on this call have those top performers who really know how to have that conversation really do have that consultative nature in them to really draw out that, that feeling of trust and really function in a way that takes them from the seller and really moves them into that kind of consultative mindset. 
And that behavior, those behaviors that are intrinsic to someone who is a top performer and can do that naturally, really, that's the kind of thing that we want to draw out when we talk about sales training, when we talk about the types of models, behaviors that we want to have in our sellers, is taking them from that transactional mindset, being able to help them be uh, focused on building that trust. And thank you, Tim, for pulling up this, this slide here. But, you know, ha having them really be able to take a step back, move out of that transactional mindset and become that strategic partner, what we call a, a trusted advisor. And when you really are able to do that, that's the ability to kind of change the way that you are approaching your customers. If, if you're not being able to do that now, I mean, that's when you really are. You see the bottom here, um, or it's a you know, professional visitor or, or product provider. That is really that, that it tends to be the baseline. That's where you end up, you're, you're kind of coming to your, 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 um, your customers and you're meeting them and talking about their needs and you're fulfilling that immediate need. But those top two tiers, that technical expert, that trusted advisor, you really aren't going to get that unless you're able to have that consultative conversation. And that's definitely that, that building trust. And how do you build trust? I mean, there, there's, you know, through the ability to build those relationships and create strong connections and really foster that openness. It takes, you know, we call will, skill, and knowledge. And there's kind of two sides to a coin. You know, when you talk about how you're selling, it's there's a, a, a sales, your process and your, the, the steps you go through and the tools you use. But the other half of that is really your behaviors. How are you using those behaviors to really draw out that? And what are those skills? And that's really essentially the, the focus of what we mean when we say consultative selling. So you see here, you know, the approach of consultative selling and being consultative, having that customer focused mindset and building trust, connect and foster openness through, this is really, you know, through your words, through the questions you ask, through the presence and the, the confidence you exude using authentic curiosity to deeply understand needs. You know, obviously this has been a staple, a, a, a consistent theme throughout sales, throughout all of history. But where I think in the last five years, we really see this to, um, uh, has really changed a lot lately is when you talk about the ability to shape customer thinking. Shaping customer thinking really is where you separate the typical sellers, the, the your, your more baseline sellers with, your true consultants. And this is where we change what used to be a, you know, we ask questions, we listen for needs, and then we position the immediate solution. Being able to shape uh, thinking and share ideas is, is really, you know, when you're able to establish that two-way street, that's when you start to function at that top of the pyramid, as we saw in that last slide, as a, as a true trusted advisor. When you're able to be a trusted advisor like that and bring insight and bring value, you're no longer seen as a seller, you're seen as a consultant. But you know, as all sellers can attain, and myself included, it's what we feel is important. What we feel is is what is you know an insight is not always what the customer sees, and and that's where you can have the most compelling case study or the most compelling story, but if you're not delivering it in a way that is going to foster that trust and and make the uh, have the customer be receptive to hearing it, it doesn't land and it doesn't work out well. And that's where those soft skills that other side of the coin, so you've got your processes, your tools, but the other side is really how are you um, communicating those dialogue skills? These, you know, you know, this is your emotional intelligence. You're the way you drive the conversation, the way you can adapt to the, the customer, really pick up on their emotional state, pick up on what is important to them. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, what we hear in the, in the industry a lot is, you know, you need to be able to uh, make sense of things for the customer. So the, the art of sense making. Often, you know, we will position a solution to a customer, assume that they can connect the dots and understand where the value comes from. But it's that, you know, it, we can't rely on that because there's too much information. There's too much competing information out there. There are everything labeled as a study, you know, a, a, a case study, an article, a white paper, it's information overload. And really, if you're able to position your message in a way that tells a story that really connects to value for the customer, that's when you're connecting those dots with the customer. You're really going through that, that sense-making behavior that really helps you to bring those ideas, share those ideas, keep curiosity within the customer to say, you know, this person really knows what they're doing. They're looking out for me, foster that trust and really, you know, an exceptional buying experience that's going to not only, you know, win profitable business, but also establish you there as, you know, you're no longer someone who's going to become, if I have a need, I'm going to get an answer. It's more around here are my ideas. Here's what I'm trying to do in the, in the future. Let me tell you about my goals and how can you help me reach those goals? So you're no longer transactional at that point. That's that 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 trusted advisor.
not every customer is going to warrant, you know, the time and attention. And quite frankly, the, the opportunities may not be as valuable to really warrant that, but that's part of the, the consultative experience is really uncovering that full range of opportunity, understand those needs. And, you know, is this someone that is really worthy of us being a trusted advisor? You know, there are going to be some where it's like, we've tapped out to the top tier of this account and we know it's transactional. We'll get through that quick. We'll spend our time where our time is most valuable. And that's where that, again, that top of the pyramid, when you can get there with your strategic accounts and it really just paves the way for growing that relationship and moving you to that top tier. So we talked a bit about this trusted advisor and what consultative selling is. You can go to that, yeah, there you go, that framework slide. So this, what our answer to upskilling sellers to become consultative is what we call our consultative selling framework. You know, what this is not, this is not a sales process. This is not a, a step-by-step -step, um, pursuit model that's going to take you through the opportunity. What this is, is a dialogue model, a dialogue framework. So how do you show up in that moment in front of the customer? And, you know, this framework is one that we adapt for brand new sellers. It's one we adapt for service professionals moving into a sales role. It's also one we adapt for our most senior sellers who, you know, are dealing with enterprise level or, or you know, government accounts through healthcare, through, you know, finance, through anything that we may have you. But the ability to adapt a dialogue framework to meet customers where they are, to meet them where they are and really be able to establish that dialogue that's the goal of this framework. So you kind of see as it goes across, it's, it's a linear framework and, you know, prepare, connect, understand, recommend, commit, act. But each individual step here is, is again, in that moment of dialogue, with the exception of prepare, which is where I'm, I'm going to start. When you look at pre preparation, how you prepare for that dialogue, it's, you know, there are many sellers who, who are, you know, they, they feel they prepare well, but what does it really mean to prepare? And, you know, I, Again, all of us are guilty of this as well. You know, when you get onto a call, you know, I, I, I remember my customer, I, I know my fit, I know what I'm going to position, and that tends to be where it ends. But when you're really trying to be consultative and really demonstrate what it means to be a trusted advisor and put yourself in that position to win and position to become a trusted advisor, knowing your strategy for the call, that final step at the bottom of, of that model is so important. And when we say know your strategy, that's when we look at this, this framework and we talk about, okay, how am I going to connect? What, how am I going to create a positive tone on this call? What am I actually going to say? What is my rapport cue that I might know? Maybe, you know, if I had spoken to Tim as a customer six months ago, and I remember that he was going on vacation, trying to pull something out there to help build that rapport. And again, establishing that connection through emotional intelligence in a way that comes off as customer focused and really is going to build that trust. So as you continue to know your strategy, not only are you thinking about, you know, those solutions you're talking about, how am I going to open this conversation? And then, you know, what questions am I going to ask? Again, not just simply saying, I'm going to ask about this. I'm going to ask about that. It's how am I going to say it? How am I going to structure my questions? When I, when I, what, what possible ideas could I float here to really pique curiosity? And then how am I going to connect those answers to value? How am I going to position my recommendation and ask for a commitment? That's really the way to prepare that extraordinary preparation that it takes to build out those conversations and really move yourself up to that trusted advisor level. And not only, and what we see actually too is not only does that help sellers really prepare for those calls, but that's where the role of the sales manager comes in as well. If I'm a seller and I've prepared, I know my customer, I know my fit, and I've also really thought out my call strategy. What am I going to say and how am I going to say it? How am I going to establish value? As a sales manager, that's that's where the, your role is so valuable. If you can look at that ahead of time and say, hey, you know, you're going to ask, you have a question here that may be about, you know, uh, a possible solution, but you haven't tied it to any value. There's nothing here that said, well, why would the customer want to answer this question outside of it being self-serving to your organization? And it, when you're able to do that and look, stop and look and, and think about how you're plant preparing, it, it just takes your ability to... Um, have those conversations to another level. And we talk about that, know your strategy, we map it to this framework. So as we continue to move through it, you'll see resolving objections in between each of these, each of these items. <clears throat> we do that intentionally because, you know, as you move through a dialogue framework, whether it's connecting and asking questions, but really obviously a, a, a customer objection or a customer concern can arise at any moment. It, it can be right up front, if, you know, especially for 
cold calling or prospecting and you're trying to establish connecting, an objection might just be, I just don't have time. I don't have time right now, you know? But how do you prepare for those objections? And, you know, the initial thought for many sellers is to simply explain why the objection is wrong. Why, why am I valuable? Why we should still continue this conversation? But what we want to, again, really root this into that, those concepts of emotional intelligence and think, if somebody has a concern, what do I do? What's the best way to resolve that objection? We teach a way to, you know, first acknowledge that this concern, this objection is important to the customer. Simply saying something, you know, you know if, if the objection is, this is just too expensive. You know, being able to acknowledge that, you know, I, I can fully understand that budget is extremely important to you. Just being able to acknowledge that the customer is heard in a way that really is going to help them to feel, all right, at least you've acknowledged that I have this, this, this concern, this is important. And before simply saying, here's why it's not expensive and here's why it is valuable, asking questions to understand what that customer truly means behind that objection. So in the example we just talked about where it's too expensive, you know, simply saying, you know, I, I understand that, that budget is very important to you. Help me to understand a bit more. What are you comparing us to when you say we're too expensive? So really helping to understand that full picture of what that concern is. It might be that in that case, the customer is comparing you to another solution that while yes, it's cheaper, does not have all the features and benefits of your solution. So it lets you to kind of tie it back to true value that in, in the customer's perception, because if the customer doesn't perceive value, then the value is meaningless in this conversation. By asking that question in that situation, you've kind of drilled down a bit more and now you understand what that comparison is and what, when the uh, customer says this is too expensive, what they mean. And it allows you to then position back a, a, a statement or a, another question that's going to help drill down and really establish that value. And finally, the last thing you an, an, an objection or a concern like that is simply saying, how well did that answer your question or how well did that address your need? Because, you know, there's sometimes there's a fear of the unknown for sellers. And we feel that I, I said something, he's not complaining about that objection anymore. I'm going to move on. But in reality, that objection still might be there. So being able to ask a checking question and say, how well did that, did that resolve your need? You know, because if it didn't, it's going to surface later when you ask for commitment. So you might as well get it now where you can still address it and still control the narrative about how you resolve that objection. And if there's a, you know, a need there to further ask questions to continue that process until you've drilled down a bit more. Because we talked about those objections can come at any point. So we've, we've talked about you know, being able to establish a connection, setting context and positioning purpose. You know, and this is one I, I think that as much of the world moved to virtual as a result of the pandemic, being able to set that context, position, purpose, and create a positive tone and really make a connection. I mean, there's a, a seismic shift in your ability to do that. There, you know, you might have some sellers who are very well tenured and have always been great relationship builders, but the move to virtual has taken them out of their comfort zone. And you know, now you're, you exist within this small box and you have to be able to come in there and demonstrate that confidence, demonstrate that presence. And that's another one of those emotionally intelligent um, skills that in this program, and as we talk about sales training and what that means, how do, you can, how, you know, how do we really instill that into sellers and what that means to really instill confidence? And quite frankly, you know, when you're in a, a, either a webinar situation like this and everyone is simply a, you know, names or, or, or faces, still draw them in, have that attention, be able to you know, uh, inspire confidence that this is a meeting worth taking and have somebody really be able to pay attention to you and, and focus on, on, know that you're focused on their needs. So as you continue through this framework now, once you've kind of been able to establish that confidence through your tone of voice, your words, you're now ready to start asking those questions. So if this is a discovery call that you're on with a customer, you know, you've, you've kind of transitioned from that. You've built some, you've started to establish a bit of a connection, that relationship and start to really foster trust. Now you're ready to ask questions. And obviously as sellers, you know, we're all ready to ask questions. That's what we do we tend to focus on that current situation. Again, I wanna get a sale and I wanna close that sale as quickly as I can. And I, wanna, I don't wanna waste the customer's time. So I ask, you know, what's working for you now? What do you need? You know, what do you wanna improve? And then I, I position my solution and I close it. But that's again, that's that product provider level. That's that at best, you're a technical expert, but you're not a trusted advisor for doing that. And really in, when we talk about how we want to people to ask questions, how we want sellers to evolve their questioning approach. 
it really comes down to being able to ask a full range of questions. And again, tying back to your preparation, what questions am I going to ask? So I might ask about you know, the current situation, what's working well, where would you like to see improvement? But also, you know, you know, how satisfied are you with you know, the current situation? Then thinking about, you know, what do you want to do? What's your goals for the next or your, you know, your six month objectives? Further that, you know, what's your what strategic initiatives are impacting your, your annual goals, your two year goals? You know, what's the decision making process for this? You know, is it uh, is there a panel, is there a committee, or are you the, the sole decision maker? Really understanding that full range of situations there, you know, or, or what would be the implementation process? You know, how do you see this? And when you ask those kinds of questions, not only are you you know really helping the customer to see out that you want to understand their full situation. But you're also really looking at it mentally, you're taking note of what that customer is saying. You're listening for cues. You're listening for things that might say, hey, yeah, you know, you, we're, we're talking about this financial solution to help us, you know, for a digital transformation. But we've also got an additional need where we're going to be, uh, you know, they are expanding our business and we've got additional um, facilities, facilities opening up. So that, you know, depending on your solution set, that's when you start to hear those cues and clues. And by asking that full range of questions, you step out of that transactional need and you start to talk about the bigger picture, the holistic need. And it can be, you know, it can be uncomfortable for a lot of sellers. And, you know, there are, you've probably got your top performers who are unconsciously doing this now. And then you've got your large chunk of middle performers who sometimes do it. And then sometimes, you know, maybe they don't feel as comfortable doing it. And then again, quite frankly, there are going to be some sellers who are, just simply not cut out for those types of conversations. And that's part of that manager experience as you go through and determine who's your top performers, who's those mid-levels that are worth really investing in, and then who are those that are maybe better suited for a more transactional position or more of a service position. But being able to kind of step out of that role and, and help that mid-level really adapt to becoming more consultative and having that questioning strategy to really listen for those cues really takes your organization to the next level. And that's, again, where the role of manager, it's not just sales management, it's coaching, it's developmental coaching to these skills. That, that pairing and you know, having your managers function as those experts to really help reinforce these behaviors, these skills in everyday life with your sellers helps to move them to that, that strategic level. And we talk about, you know, as you ask those questions, not only does that help you better position your solution, but it also, again, when you hear those cues, that's when you can sort of float new ideas, start to broaden that conversation. And this is where, as we said, a lot of sellers tend to this, you know, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be, I don't want to be too salesy on this call or, or you know, this, this isn't going to fly with this, this customer. They're, they're looking for solution A. That's all they want to talk about. But it's important to not view this as an add-on. These questions are not add-ons. The customer has said there's some, another initiative. So let's help them understand how you can add value. And, you know, little behavioral changes here can help make that transition to the broader dialogue much more natural. And we talk about that throughout consultative selling. So when we say something like, again, how you plot your question, instead of, you know, simply saying, you know, we also have solution X, which could meet your needs. You know, Tim, earlier, you mentioned that you're possibly expanding a bit more in addition to, you know, our, what we were discussing earlier. Tell me a bit more about that expansion. You know, as you mentioned, when you're, you know, when we see with expansions, we've seen other customers be able to benefit through why. So it's a way to kind of tie it back. You're not only are you demonstrating that you're interested, but you're using active listening. You're, you're saying you're using the customer's name. You're talking about the words they said earlier, and you're pulling that back into the conversation. So it's not an add-on when you do that. You're, you're incorporating that part into the conversation, and that becomes the dialogue. The dialogue is now about not just the immediate need, but it's, it's the full holistic picture. And, you know, that's something that even the best sellers need practice at. They need to prepare. They need to talk to their manager with, because, you know, in the heat of the conversation, in the, in the middle of that moment, it's the, the, the focus will always still be on that immediate need. But as you can kind of help the customer to see that value, connect the dots, make sense for them and preface your, your, your questions, your, your positioning with benefits to the customer, I mean, that's where you can really position yourself as a trusted advisor and, and expand that conversation. So we talked a bit about how we would establish value and, you know, pulling in those additional, that, those additional needs and kind of, you know, uh, really focusing on what's important to the customer. But then we kind of talked about that recommend stage. So as you position a recommendation, 
we talked about a lot of best practices here around, you know, you know, everything we've covered to this point, checking with them, with the customer to really make sure that as we kind of go through this conversation, we're following with the customer. We're saying, you know, what are your thoughts on what we've positioned so far? So before we get to the actual recommendation, we want to make sure that, that the customer has followed us so far and now we're ready to position our recommendation. Talk about an overview. We talked about, hey, based on what you've said up here, <clears throat> we have a solution that will meet your needs through the following things. We'll say, here's an overview. The solution is part A, part B, and part C. Then we position the detail. We'll say, okay, you know, part A, meet your needs through the following things. And we talk about when we position something, we want to do so in a way that, again, if we're positioning it, it's tied to customer value. And a little behavior change can be so in, uh, meaningful. And we talk about that behavior change here really around an issue. Here's a customer issue. We call this our value statement structure. It's whenever we position something, we want to do so in a, in a value statement structure. So that would be, you know, here's the issue. The customer mentioned X. That's the issue. The action then is, is what your, your solution can be. What's, what's, the, what's the action your organization can take? And then the value. What's the value the customer would receive? Issue, action, value. So as you position something, it's so important to be able to do that. It, you know, it, it can be quick. It doesn't have to be a, a, a you know, really drawn out, um, overly thoughtful, overly engineered statement. But it can, again, simply saying, you know, you know, Tim, you mentioned your, your objective was to grow revenue by, by 5%. One of the ways we've seen to do that with our organization is through our training programs that can help you to really upskill your sellers. And, and the value we've typically seen for that is sellers are able to be on board faster. Their time to close decreases by X percent and then it will help you achieve that goal. So you've done an issue and action to value. It's connecting the dots for the customer so that the customer does not have to bear that load themselves. And as you do that, you continue to go through, you check for feedback. You say, you know, how well does what we've discussed here meet your needs and, and really understand it, but that as you continue to position that solution, you're continuously checking for feedback. So then before you get to asking for a commitment, you've really understood what that is important to the customer. You can position your closing statement and really, again, do one final check, ask for a commitment. And then when this is the one of the hardest things that we teach, honestly, is as you ask for commitment, silence. We So far, we've wanted to be the consultants. We've wanted to be checking for feedback. We've wanted to be asking. But as you ask for that final commitment and you really position that statement around, you know, everything we've discussed, as far as there's no additional needs, you, you, you figure that out and you ask for that final ask, being comfortable with that silence. Let the customer respond. And that can be a huge challenge for a lot of sellers who are, you know, we're salespeople, we like to talk, you know, and being able to, to really be a bit more comfortable with that silence and letting the customer digest and letting the customer respond before, you know, and if it's a, if it's a no or a, a delay, that's when you kind of go back to that resolve objections and you start to talk about how timelines are important and, and you know, help me to understand, you know, what are your, what's your thought process here and really digging into that before making that additional effort. But, you know, sometimes that commitment is a follow-up, but as long as it's a measurable commitment, something that you can objectively say is progressing the opportunity for that commitment, whether it's closing the sale, whether it's a follow-up with a senior decision maker or, you know, agreeing agreement to send a proposal, being able to achieve that commitment ties back to the value you've established throughout that conversation. So when you've got, you've gained agreement, you're going to leave that positive last impression. And then what happens after that is no longer the moment of dialogue, but it's also where a lot of sellers tend to fall off is being able to follow through. So we talk about debriefing internally in that act stage, but one of the most important things is, is being able to send a written summary to the customer because, you know, being able to recap that value in, in your, in an email to the customer following the meeting, sometimes it might just be, you know, it's great speaking with you today, just um, to ensure that we're well aligned on what we discussed. We talked about here are the, the um, various uh, issues facing your organization. We discussed how uh, our solution for X can meet your needs to improve Y. And we set a follow-up that we would send a, uh, you know, a response or a proposal by Friday of this week. Being able to recap that and just keep that top of customer mind, get it in writing, and then really being able to um, kind of debrief and, and make sure that, that you have that information front and center. And if you have a trusted contact, being able to debrief with them, you, you've got your record there and, and what you discussed and really talk about how you're going to implement those action steps. So in conclusion for the consultant selling framework, this framework here is, again, we adapt this to our, our big enterprise sellers and our, and our, or our clients that might be doing, you know, phone-based inside sales, but 
really this framework is is dialogue and how we put this forth in training in classroom and digital content is in those real scenarios so we want the audience to kind of come ready to discuss you know how they put this to play because if they can't see this in play in their real scenarios their real life then it's, it's worthless we need to really be able to establish that for them that this will work it does work and here's how it would work we have put them through real examples have them do role plays drills exercises where they're talking about their real customer opportunities and working through this with a facilitator working through this with their manager and committing these things to memory these behaviors and you know even if you're not 100 proficient at the entire framework but as you continue to develop you're picking up those best practices maybe it's you know asking questions with a benefit or that issue action value which we'll talk a bit about more in a moment but being able to do that really can take you to that next level so this framework then is is the structure of the dialogue and i've, I've touched a bit on this a, a moment but if you can go to the next slide the next slide really is what are those soft skills that power that framework we, we, we've talked a bit about these as i went through that framework but you know our the founder of richardson who's uh linda richardson about 35 40 years ago was really grounded in psychology and the, the psychology of persuasion. And she identified these six critical skills that are not just important for selling, but for any kind of conversation where you want to be able to establish a connection and foster trust. You know, we talked about presence, being able to project your confidence and your credibility. This is, you know, again, with virtual, it's, it's, it's being able to have even body language in a small little window like this and being able to establish that confidence. And avoiding avoiding you know weak or insecure language. Instead of as a customer, if I want someone to to solve a problem for me, and they're using language like you know I think we might I I can't you know that's not going to inspire confidence. So again, little best practices using strong confident language, and then being able to you know you see the second one there relating being able to use rapport, empathy when necessary you know to to um, to establish that connection. And it's important because empathy and sympathy are, are similar, but not always the same. And it's, you know, if a customer comes to you and, you know, hey, maybe they have a service issue or, or, you know, maybe they say, you know, this is, is, this is too expensive. You don't want to say, I'm sorry. You're not sorry for it. You don't want to have, you know, sympathy in a situation for that. It's, it's, you can have empathy, which is a bit more neutral, neutral acknowledgement. You know, I, I understand it's important. That's the acknowledgement. The, the, the acknowledgement is not, you know, I'm sorry, you feel this is too expensive because that, that, puts you on a, a lower playing field and, and puts you on the defensive for price uh, pressure. Um, questioning and listening, these are really those core core skills here. When you, we talked about when you question, you know, being able to preface your questions with a benefit, asking open-ended questions to explore. You know, prefacing your question with a benefit, again, we might, it's just a, you know, I, I don't want to ask my customer, you know, what is your budget for this initiative? Because that's self-serving. It sounds like I'm saying I'm going to charge you the maximum amount that you say. But what we want to do is, you know, preface that question with a benefit. It might simply be you know, so I can make sure I'm uh, delivering the most value for you and in, in, in delivering the appropriate solution. Help me to understand what is your budget for this solution? So really being able to tie it back to why are you asking this so that you can make sure that it's going to deliver the maximum value. This might be, you know, as you ask your first question or your last question, but being able to do so in a way that really puts the customer first and is tied back to that skill of listening. You know, we say active listening. We talked about that earlier where you might say, you know, you know, Tim, earlier you mentioned this before you asked the question. You're using that active listen to show the customer that, that during this conversation, I've heard what you said. I'm thinking about it and I'm tying that value back to what you said, why it's important to you. And then positioning as you position that information, you know, positioning in a way that is is tailored, logical, and, and relevant for the customer. That's that issue, that action, that value. And then checking, again, that, that we kind of said it's the super skill. It's one that a lot of sellers tend to avoid simply because it's, it can be uncomfortable, but simply saying, you know, what are your thoughts on that? What, what are your thoughts on what we shared so far? Not asking a yes or no question. So not, not do you agree? It's, it's getting that, getting an open-ended question, you know, what are your thoughts? Really trying to have the customer become part of that dialogue as you go through. Because if you're continuously checking and you've gotten positive feedback throughout, that puts you in great position as you start to ask for that commitment because you already know the customer is comfortable with everything. And that's that super skill to really kind of round out these critical skills. Um, I can take us in a bit more deep dive on the next page, uh, next slide, which just to, I want to touch on, we talked about that questioning strategy. Again, so we've talked about how we structure our questions in the context of a larger framework. We talked about those soft skills about, you know, prefacing our questions for benefit, but 
really developing that questioning strategy. So we, we, we shape it as a funnel because you, you know, ten, the, the largest um, uh, time spent tends to be on current objectives, current situations. But we really want to help them narrow that funnel down as you continue to go and refine it. Levels of satisfaction. What are the future needs? Personal needs is often one that can be difficult to broach, but it's so important. This helps you to really identify who can be a customer coach or who can be a really a, a key contact. Because if you're able to identify something that's personal in this for the customer, you know, say the customer was recently promoted into this new position and this is their first major initiative, you know, what they need to do then is establish credibility within their own organization. And you're going to help them do it by, by partnering with them on this initiative, becoming that strategic partner, that trusted advisor for them. And when you can do that and really understand the person what's in it personally for them, I mean, that's, that's, that puts you in a position for success that few other sellers can say they can do. And that's, you know, as you do that, you, you'll find that, you know, that your relationship changes with that customer and you really are at that top tier. And again, that questioning strategy, this is where preparation comes into play. And actually, you can go to the, the next slide as well. The, uh, on the next slide, we talk about how we, you know, we structure that value. So we, we, as we're preparing, we've plotted out our questions. We, we said how we're going to ask those questions. And we said what questions we're going to ask. And then how are we going to tie our value together? This is really around what's important to the customer. How can you help? And so what? That issue, that action, the value. So, you know, if you can't identify a customer issue, that's relevant to the solution you want to provide, the action you want your organization to take, th there's no point for you to deliver it because you have not identified that. You're simply a commodity. You've commoditized yourself when you do that. But if you can position your statements in this way, this issue, action, value, again, it doesn't have to be over-engineered. This does not have to be a, a multi-paragraph, um, you know, contextualized statement. It can be something very simple when we said earlier, just, you know, you mentioned this is important to you. One of the things we've seen that's helpful is by taking solution X. And what we typically see is customers are able to see an, a return on investment of 5% within one year. Being able to tie it back to that very quickly, and it, it doesn't always have to be something tied to your solution. Often it can be, you know, your value statement could be the value in meeting with a senior decision maker, you know? You know, you, you mentioned that it's, it can be difficult to pull in all the different parts of business and gain alignment. One thing we've seen is by pulling in a senior level decision maker, helps to allow us to um, you know, really get everybody aligned and really make sure that they can also see the value as we go forward. So it's, you, know, you can kind of structure that statement in a way that if your commitment is asking for a solution or asking for another meeting, it's always important to tie it back to customer value. And really, if you can establish that, that uh, customer needs and connecting them to value, really that's what the core of being consultative is. You put the customer first, you've identified that full range of needs, you've gotten out of being transactional. And then as you really earn the right to have that broader conversation, you're delivering value. You're delivering value tied directly to statements the customer has said. And being able to connect those dots, make sense of it for the customer, elevates you to that, that level of trusted advisor. And, and that, that really is the core of what it means to be consultative. So I'd love to, you know, unless, um, uh, uh, Tim, Sawan, anybody has any questions? I'm, I'm happy to, to, to field questions from, from the audience or just anything. Um, yep, I'm happy to provide insight. Thank you, uh, Michael. We have a question actually. Uh, and first of all, thank you so much for covering those slides, especially the consultative selling framework. Uh, we have a question. Uh, it says, while prospecting, uh, what are the factors to be considered uh, while preparing our dialogues? Uh, would you like to elaborate? I mean, address that, please. Yeah, I want to make sure I heard the question. What was the, the, the last statement there? So you said when, when preparing for, for prospecting, how do we kind of adapt this to, to prospecting? Right. And what yeah. factors to be considered, uh, you know, creating dialogues? Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, and prospecting can be, can be obviously extremely difficult. You know, when you talk about um, being able to establish value, I mean, how difficult is that when you're talking about you either you're calling or you're simply writing an email, you know, that same issue action value is key, but the way you go about it is, is what really changes there. Because, you know, if, if you, if you manage to get somebody on the phone, you've probably got 15 seconds to establish some kind of value that is, makes this worthwhile. 
you know, just in, in all of our positions, I'm sure we get plenty of solicitation emails. And, you know, a lot of times it'll be a very generic statement. But the ones that I've always seen to be the most effective are the ones that, that have done their research on my organization and myself, knowing that I've just moved into a new position. You know, here's my, my issue. Here's a, 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 a value, an action that my organization can take. And here's what we've typically seen. You know, it's it, it doesn't it's not a guaranteed um, success, but it does increase your chances. It increases your chances of being seen. So I think you distill certain elements of consultative dialogues and really around how you position a strong value message. And that's again that issue that action the value. So whether you're doing that on on the first 15 seconds of a phone call or whether you're structuring an email or a LinkedIn message, it's really all tied back to identifying something, anything that is any information you can glean on this customer to identify an issue before you position the value of, of meeting, of, of, a, of, a, of a follow-up conversation. And that's really what our, you know, we can really focus in on that when we talk about prospecting. How well does that answer the question? I think that was very nice. And uh, thank you once again for addressing it. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, lots of things have gone virtually. So. Uh, we have some virtual sellers joined us with us today. Uh, the question is, how do sales professionals uh, do better uh, while selling virtually, uh, having clients abroad, and how do what factors they can improve to sell virtually better? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it's funny because when one of the things we saw is some of you, some of the most established sellers struggled the most with switching to virtual. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's everything, even the, how professional your, your background is being able to have a professional background, showing up on a virtual call in a way that inspires confidence. It, it's all part of building that, that, that skill of presence. So, you know, I think that, that to be a better seller virtually one is, you know, you have to kind of show up and establish that confidence Two is, you know, the, the rules of engagement, the way you show up on a virtual call changes a bit. You know, I, I think that establishing that you're going to be on video, you know, before you get on the call. So if you were sending an invitation to customers, say, you know, again, issue action value in your email says, you know, we found that being on video helps to foster a connection. So on this call, I'll be on video, you know, and then asking a question to them to really say, you know, you know, would you like to be on video as well? Kind of tying it back to that, that value of being on video that you've established. Because once, you know, being able to do that, being able to establish that that's the norm, again, you're going to stand out from your competitors if they're not doing that. And then, you know, as you show up on those virtual calls and your level of preparation is different. So for if Tim and I are team selling, you know, it's, it's, it's not that just I have a copy of the slide deck. It's that Tim also has a copy of the slide deck. Because if I get kicked off and I lose that deck, and then Tim's there in front of an executive who has five minutes to give us or 10 minutes to give us in the next month. That's our one chance. You know, we need to show up, we're prepared. So the way you prepare is different, but I think your same skills apply, but it's the way you prepare and the way you show up when I call has to change and adapt. And the way you do that is by, you know, just being able to still inspire that confidence that you can help the customer, even though that, you know, you're in a different modality. Excellent. Uh, Michael, we have uh, a question which has two parts, basically. Uh, it says, what is the effect of social media on the customer persona? And the second part is how it will be useful to take it as an advantage in the business. Yeah, another great question, too. And we see this a lot now, especially with, with prospecting. Um, you know, Efficient use of LinkedIn, for sure, is, is one that we, we get a lot of information on. And I think there, when you talk about the way you use LinkedIn, this is where you really need to have an outreach plan. The way you're going to reach out to someone on LinkedIn and, and sell to them, because you know I'm sure we can all attest that we get a lot of solicitation emails from, from LinkedIn messages, but how do you make it stand out? What's your touch point plan? Often, you know, we'll talk a bit more in, in, in around being able to have a certain amount of touch points up front. So maybe, you know, as you reach out through social media, you have your high touch for the first couple of weeks, and then you kind of tail it off a bit. And you're going to be checking in with, again, value statements through, through, through uh, email, through posts, or, you know, whether it's on Twitter, how you're going to do it. 
really it's around making sure you've done your research, being able to tie it back through, through email and then establishing your touch points. Cause you're, you know, ideally you're, you're going to get a response in your first, your first attempt, but that isn't always the case, but being able to leverage LinkedIn that way and say, here's my touch point plan. I want to, I want to get into Apple and the way I'm going to get into Apple is by going through them, by looking at LinkedIn and finding five different folks who are in relevant uh, positions. And I'm going to reach out to them one by one. I'm going to do my touch point plan here first, and I'm going to move on to the next, but you know, it's, it's a way to kind of come off as strategic without being too pushy. And there's a balance there to strike. And I think that that's really around where, again, working with your, your manager and preparing a high touch up front and then kind of tailing that off. But it's, it's an art, it's an art. It really is. And it's, it's, it can be difficult, but leveraging LinkedIn in that way, um, obviously is, is extremely powerful. And sales navigator too, which is the extension right. for, for salespeople also very useful. Yeah. Thanks Dan. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, Michael, one more question, uh, because there are a lot of people in real estate uh, who have joined us today because Dubai is a big market when it comes to real estate. Uh, how do you address those people? What can they do better because they meet clients, there are agents involved, how consultative selling can help them in the real estate market? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you say real estate, you know, I mean, obviously you mean either uh, direct to customer or, or, or business to business, but for like direct to customer uh, B2C, you know, we've worked with many real estate um, um, clients where their, their agents are going out and for folks trying to, you know, buy a home. And I think in that case, you know, your, your value there is, is all the more important because you're not really selling a product. You're selling yourself as a, as an agent or you're selling your ability to, to deliver value. And it's really around, again, like when you think about consultative selling or, or what we've talked about so far, it's not heavy sales language. It's, it's human connection. It's, it's being able to establish that dialogue. So whether you're in real estate or pharmaceuticals, being able to, to really ask questions that draw out what's important to the customer, what's important to a home buyer, what's important to, to an agent. And knowing that, that what, once you've identified what's important, if you're in a position, whatever it is that you can do to help them, whether it's you know, showing them an additional home or whether it's showing a new location for a corporate business, you're doing it in the way that ties back to what's important to them. So we use this, this same framework and the same skills for whether you're talking to a, a, a family looking to buy a home or you're talking to an organization looking to buy new office space. But you just, it's the, the you adapt that conversation, your emotional intelligence, the way you, you, you speak to that customer you meet them where they are through those skills and, you know, your ability to use presence and relating to really identify what's important to them and adapt your presence back to them. So for something like real estate, you know, the same skills apply, but the way you approach it and the way that you can make that connection changes. And that's really where um, it establishes again, who is a transactional seller and who is somebody who you trust and somebody who can be a real advisor to you. Excellent. Uh, Michael, we have two more requests. Uh, number one is, like the sales managers are here also with us and you were mentioning about how they are so important to coach their executives. Uh, they just want some examples on how to coach uh, their executives. Would you like to just cover this up? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. We often differentiate, in this case, we differentiate the difference between being a sales manager and a developmental coach. So both are part of the sales manager's role. Manage, being a manager means I'm managing the seller through, okay, let's look at your pipeline. Let's talk about your, your goals and your numbers. Let's see where we're at and managing those skills. But being a developmental coach is where it changes. You're not, you know, a, a manager tends to look at lagging indicators, you know, numbers, re results. A, a coach is looking at behaviors and skills. So this is where, you know, if I'm going to be, um, on a call with my direct report, with my, with my seller. And I, I see, you know, let's look at what you prepared for this call. Look at those questions. Again, this is where you, it gives you the opportunity before you even get in front of the customer to really look at what the seller is planning to do. Look at how they're using those skills. Are they really connecting a customer issue to value? And then when they get on that call, ideally, you know, a manager should at least be able to listen in or, or join their sellers occasionally for calls to get a, a, a touch point on, are they using those skills and are they doing it? And then being able to immediately debrief with their seller. So soon after the call, setting aside, you know, 15 minutes to say, how do you, know, how do you think that call went? Asking the seller, 
and getting their perspective on how that call went and then kind of comparing it back to how the, what they what they prepared did they kind of follow their own preparation did they use those skills but you know as a seller as a, as a manager being able to ask them questions to have your your seller kind of report back on how they feel it went before you give your own perceptions that really is the key to, to, to strong coaching because if you do that you help the seller to kind of self-realize where those areas for improvement are. And oftentimes they know what the areas to improvement are, but they want that reinforcement. And that's where the job of manager is to draw that out. So not just telling, but but helping to coach through asking tends to be a really effective way of, of coaching. Superb. Um, the one other request, uh, Michael, is from one of the participants to just review the slides once again. Maybe you can just spend around five to seven seconds on every slide. Would that be okay from the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do, do so. Just a <clears throat> so I'll just touch on the what the key the key point is for each slide. Yeah, let's let's start with this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think here we're, what we're talking about is again, if you're trying to be what consultative means, what you want to be consultative is being able to establish trust. Everybody knows that when you start talking to a seller who is self-serving, you immediately shut down. You see that science that says you trigger a threat response. So if I'm approached by a seller who's gonna to come to me and ask something about, you know, uh, am I interested in X? I, I don't even know what it is, I'm not interested. So I, I, I'm not, I have no trust there. So really the, the ability to build trust is key to becoming a trusted advisor, to being a, a consultant. This next one, again, just really kind of sets context for what we mean when we talk about, so you've established trust, being a trusted advisor, that top pinnacle of the, of the pyramid, not every account or opportunity warrants you being a trusted advisor, but the ones that you do, the ones that you've identified, being that top level where you're not only asking about questions, but you're bringing value. Every meeting you have, you're sharing insights and you're bringing value strategically to that, again, issue action value. You're tying it back to them. Puts you in that trusted advisor tier. Um, yeah, the consultative selling approach, again, we kind of talked about, you know, being able to connect and foster openness. My favorite point on this one here is like being able to shape customer thinking by sharing ideas. I think a lot of folks and a lot of sellers don't realize their ability to shape customer thinking in the questions that you ask. When you think about asking questions, it's usually to get a response. But if you preface those questions and, and really share ideas, you're shaping the thinking. You're, you're shaping that opportunity and making it more broad and more inclusive. And that's a very powerful, powerful skill. Consultative selling framework, again, is not a sales process. It's a dialogue framework. It's a way you move through a conversation. So, you know, the way you prepare, the, the type of rapport you build in connection, the type of questions you ask and you understand and your ability to use active listening. And so, you know, earlier you mentioned this, here's a recommendation based on what you, you, you time your recommendation back to value. You're resolving those objections through that emotional, um, uh, emotionally intelligent way of acknowledgement, neutral acknowledgement. You're asking commitment and you're checking. And at the last stage there, act really you're following through, you're sending some kind of written follow-up that recaps everything and really helps to move through this dialogue in a way that moves you closer to some sort of demonstrable goal with each conversation. And then six critical skills. If you think about that last framework as kind of the, the skeleton, the bones of the conversation, the six critical skills are kind of the muscle that these are the, the dialogue skills, the emotionally intelligent dialogue skills to help you build presence, build rapport, ask those questions in a customer focused way and actively listen, position value and really check to, to ensure the customer is tracking and, and following along. Your questioning strategy, we talked about, about the, the skills of asking questions in a way that is open, but also what questions are you going to ask? Your objectives, your current situation where a lot of sellers tend to get stuck, but also you know, what is your level of you know, satisfaction, your future needs, six month objectives, two year goals, strategic initiatives, personal needs, what's in this for you specifically? And then finally, what is the decision-making structure? Those questions really, again, help to paint that full broader picture to help you position your solution in a way that is tied to the complete picture. And then finally, issue action value, your ability to really tie back to uh, what's important to the customer, how you can help and so what, what is in it for you? What's in it for the customer? It, it doesn't always have to be a full ROI, but it's, it's something that the customer can perceive as valuable that is a good use of their time. And being able to do that, that's that issue action value that establishes you as that, that trusted advisor. Okay, uh, we have one last question, uh, which says, 
So for a business with multiple sectors, that is real estate, showrooms, home decor, or ceramics, tiles, how does consultative selling help? I mean, it's an open-ended question the way you like it. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is, again, it's, it's really around skills. These are behavior-based skills. So, you know, we, even at my own organization, we have our sales teams go through consultative selling. We have our customer success service teams go through consultative selling. One, it's important for all teams to be speaking a consistent language so that when a customer calls X organization, they know they're going to get that same level of service throughout the organization. And also that, you know, as you, as a manager, or a coach, and I take my teams through, I, you know, when you run examples and skills drills using these questioning skills, the, the issue action value, you know, you, you adapt to what's important to your team. So if it's the ceramics team, you're talking about, Hey, a typical customer in ceramics, here's an issue they typically face. Here's the action that our organization takes and the value they get. But if you're on the real estate side and something else, you know, what's the issue there? So being able to show how this framework is flexible and it really adaptable to multiple lines of business or multiple market issues, that's super valuable. And again, where your preparation really comes into play because you don't want to do that in the moment. You should do that, understand those issues, do your research and then link to value. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think we are, we are on the conclusion over here. Uh, just to finish it off, I mean, first of all, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Tim, uh, for joining and giving us a great insight about the consultative selling over here. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Everyone learned from it. Uh, just to give you an example also, uh, you know, last few days we have been trying to invite people for this webinar. And trust me, uh, how questioning strategy works or how dialogue works there's a simple example. I mean, when you say, I would like to invite you for a webinar versus, uh, would you like to uh, attend a webinar? I mean, that, that makes a lot of difference. And there's a curiosity uh, among the buyers and they're, they're ready to answer you somewhere. So I think that's what we do over here, as in Richardson, as in Emarticus. We help employees, sales professionals, uh, you know, work on their dialogues. Uh, give them uh, themselves the time to think uh, what should be the questioning strategy. And if you are interested uh, to uh, contact us and get your salespeople the right kind of training, whether it is consultative selling, it is solution selling, or whether it is virtual selling or the sales managers who are looking to become coaches, we have all the solutions available over here. So this is my name, Savan Arya. I am a program advisor. And I'm in Dubai uh, with Emarticus. We have Miss Subela, who's our partner, and she's also in Dubai with us. And uh, overseas, we have as Michael, we have Tim, we have uh, the whole uh, 300 plus team of Emarticus learning with Mr. Suresh Rao, the founder, and Mr. Pankaj as the international sales driver. So whoever is interested to get in contact with us, you're most likely to call us on these numbers or email us over here. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you, and thank you for the questions and joining from all over the GCC and outside. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Salman. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Michael. That was an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.